Hello everyone and welcome to It's a Sign. Put on your astronaut helmets because today we are diving into a void of space-related conspiracy. Aleister Crowley, Jack Parson, Warner Von Braun, and L. Ron Hubbard. What do all these men have in common? We're going to find out today as we explore the connection between Scientology and some of the most influential figures in space exploration, as well as how they influence the modern New Age movement, and as well as the occult practices that went about in the founding of NASA. So stay tuned and let's begin. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of It's a Sign. Yeah, so today we're diving into a conspiracy theory, which we used to do way more conspiracy theories yeah. on our channel. We kind of went on a bit of an ancient history tangent, which is definitely one of Trey's biggest passions, but yeah. I myself do love bit of a conspiracy theory so i'm so excited to learn more along with you guys on today's episode and it i know that it's about scientology and and um, space and that's pretty much all i know and i definitely think um scientology is a very interesting subject so mm -hmm. i'm so excited to dive into this one yeah and for for anyone listening conspiracy theory might have some sort of buzzword that in relation for me i view a conspiracy theory as some sort of alternate theory to what the mainstream media is pumping out and you know spoon feeding us and actually, a lot of what I have is based on facts and evidence that have happened in history, though there will be a little bit of theorizing and conspiracy um, and drawing some strings together based on our own perspectives and ideas. But yeah, that's pretty much just how we view it is just um, not history that hasn't really been told that often. Yeah, and, it's like yeah. controversial and... Um, often like hidden you know yeah. what's what's under the surface what's been hidden and i do think conspiracy theories have had a you know especially um i'd say since covid and over the last few years has had a really bad reputation um but i think originally it was exactly how we see it it mm. was you know um things being you know looked into that is hidden from us yeah and that and people don't want to find out uh, the there is often like a lot of facts behind a lot of conspiracy theories and there's a there's a reason why people are diving deep into these yeah. ideas and concepts because there's something to them they are often a part of our history but it's not the history that's written in the books yeah and conspiracy kind of relates to the royal paradigm of like treason you know it's kind of modern day treason in a way <laughs> it's like oh you're you're speaking things against a certain you know narrative narrative and mm. so because of that um it could be seen as a conspiracy against that narrative when it's when you're actually just trying to um piece together the clues and pieces that have been hidden from us yeah so when we start off, um, we're kind of going to be exploring the space pioneers of our Western world and the modern age of, you know, Nikola Tesla, uh, not Nikola Tesla, Elon Musk, space rockets, NASA, all that sort of stuff. And we can't really think about space in the West without thinking of NASA because they are the leading brand of um, space exploration, Mars rovers, all sorts of things like that. And to start, um, NASA's history is not only filled with occult practices, but Nazi traces, and at its forefront, its founding was a person whose name has almost been wiped clean of our history. And we'll come to see that this might have been on purpose. And this person's name was Jack Parsons. Do you know that yeah, name? Yeah, not heard of never it. Never heard of it before. I'd never heard of it either. No. 
but Jack Parsons was born in Marvel Whiteside Parsons on October 2nd, 1914 in L.A., Cal- in L.A., California, and he was a brilliant and enigmatic figure whose life was a captivating mix of rocket science, occultism, and adventure. Growing up in Pasadena, my aunt used to live in Pasadena, <laughs> Parsons showed an early fascination with chemistry and explosives, conducting homemade experiments that both thrilled and alarmed his family. In his teams, he formed a strong interest in rocketry, inspired by the science fiction writers H.G. Wells and Jules Verne. In 1930, Parsons, along with his childhood friend Edward Foreman and later Frank Molina, founded the Caltech-affiliated Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory Rocket Research Group, (laughs) or (laughs) Galakit. And this research group focused on developing solid fuel rocket engines, and it laid the foundation for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in later years. And the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is abbreviated to JPL, and this will come up later. So in 1942, Parsons... Um, and Molina established an Aerojet Engineering Corporation and a private company that became a leading player in the aerospace industry. But Parsons' life took a mysterious turn when he encountered the works of occultist Aleister Crowley, the founder no, of the Lama. <laughs> yes. And so it's very interesting because all these people kind of started, were really starting to come about in the 1930s, 1940s, Nikola Tesla was around, Mm -hmm. just the turn of the century, um, World War II, all of that stuff was happening, Um, Aleister Crowley was around. You would never put Aleister Crowley, you know, you would never think to put him in the group of like NASA or, you know, space. (laughs) Yeah. Because he is all about the occult um, and even had like, you know, pretty dark practices pretty much a lot of black magic that he practices and you know it's interesting and I guess there was um a a lot of elite interest in what he's doing and I Mm. think that kind of um connects as well with a lot of the conspiracies around elites doing dark practices and stuff yeah and Parsons actually joined Um, Crowley's uh, order, and that was called the Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, in 1941. And he became an active uh, active member of the OTO's Agape Lodge in Southern California and integrated elements of Thelemic rituals into his life. Now, we've, most of us who kind of dabble in the esoteric world have heard of Aleister Crowley. You can't go to an esoteric bookstore without finding him there and but i didn't really actually know many of his theories or what thelema is and that's Mm -hmm. his kind of religion and his his creed that he preaches i never felt like very drawn to look too deep into his stuff but i do know he created his own tarot system which is the thoth tarot which is really popular probably like second to the right away system yeah um but again still i was never drawn to dive into that because i do think it's an energetic thing and if you feel like energetically drawn to a certain system or divination um and i just yeah i felt like a darkness around yeah well, his practices so i Stop moving <laughs> around. You're going <laughs> to knock the microphone. Whoops. Sorry, just in editing, I always see a lot of little junks. And so we're trying to cut yeah. down on that. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So Alistair Crowley, he founded um, the occult groups, including Ordo Templis Orientis and Argentum Astrum, which means the Order of the Silver Star. And... Thelema is based on the write- his writings, particularly the Book of Law, which I did try to read. It's just a bit dense and full of like abbreviations, which you have to have context to. So it's hard to kind of get in unless you haven't, you've been initiated into what those abbreviations mean, because mm-hmm. he doesn't give any clue of what they are. 
um, or kind of reference old texts it and stuff. It does really resonate with a lot of people and I've even had friends who have um, experienced like visions and things that are connected to the Book of Law. So mm. yeah, I think maybe it's something um, at the right time it will come to you and it will just resonate and you'll be able to like sort of tap into that information. Yeah, well, I did get a kind of um, also dark uh latin sort of magic you know yeah, <laughs> that, sort I of... was the same I didn't know why but I was just like it's just not I'm not drawn to it so I always follow my instincts with that stuff but I do know yeah that I've heard that a lot in the witchcraft and tarot community yeah so Alistair Crowley said that the book of law was channeled um, and dictated to him in 1904 by a holy guardian angel called Iwas. And Crowley is considered, or tells himself, to be a prophet, and I guess his followers believe him to be a prophet mm -hmm. too. And his works are the only ones considered canonical. Interpretations of those texts is left up to the individual believers. Um, so basically, the basic beliefs um, relate to what he calls the great work and thelemites strive to ascend to higher states of existence uniting oneself with the higher powers and understanding and embracing one's true will their ultimate purpose and place in life the law of thelema dictates do what thou wilt sh and shall be the whole of the law so thou wilt here means to just basically do what you want <laughs> yeah. and don't let anything get in your way, pretty much. Um, and I imagine at the time, was you know, I can see, didn't he get banned from France, Alistair? Maybe. Um, I'm pretty sure he did. And you can see why, because, you know, that's really against, like, the Christian and Catholic religion. They're definitely not preaching, do what you want. No, yeah. And we'll, we'll begin to see, like, in, in when you kind of read in at the surface of his teachings, they're quite... Um, oh, that sounds quite good. You know, he says that each person possesses unique talents, abilities, and potentials, and none should be impeded in seeking out their true self. Something that resonates. It's something that, you know, is alive in the New Age um, movement as well. And he says, love is the law, law under will. Each person is united with his true will through love. Discovering is a process of understanding and unity, not force and coercion. And he says that we live in the age of Horus, child of Isis and Osiris, who represented the previous ages. And the age of Isis was a time of matriarchy. The age of Osiris was a time of patriarchy with religious emphasis on sacrifice. And the age of Horus is an age of individualism, of the child Horus striking out on his own to learn and grow. Like, isn't Horus often connected to Jesus? Um, Osiris is. Oh, Osiris. Yeah. So we're in the, he's saying we're in the age of Horus at that time. Yeah. Okay. Um, he says, he thinks, well, yeah, at that time that they were currently in the age. Um, and there are various Thelemic deities, and it's a, basically a mishmash of different Egyptian and Celtic, all sorts of pagan things mm -hmm. mixed together. And there are various celebrations and stuff, um, including a feast for for life and the birth of a child, a feast for fire, the coming age of a boy, um, feast for water, the coming age of a girl. And I think it is important to have coming of age ceremonies, not just, you know, have your birthday parties, but then also when a child comes of age. What uh, do you mean coming of age? I become 18. Well, it could be like, yeah, it could be becoming 18 or it be, could be transitioning from you know, like boyhood into the teenage years or something. I think rituals like that and coming of age ceremonies at various stages in your life have been repeated in tribal, you know, humanity for a long time. And it's more in this age that we've kind of removed ourselves from that. But the main focus of that was to give a person purpose and drive um, and to help them overcome you know, the limitations within themselves. So it's often, you know, like a vision quest for the Native Americans would help them to, you know, overcome the things that were holding them back and find clarity moving forward into the future, to find their path and things like that. So 
when you kind of, yeah, like I said before, read on the surface, the philosophy does not appear to be bad or in the religious sense evil. It is a way of life for people to do whatever you want, from promiscuous sex to black magic, hardcore drugs, and eventually nihilistic self-destruction. What Crowley preaches <clears throat> under the surface is a pursuit of material gains and material desires. And it's to just follow that um, to the end, you know? And when you think of the material realm and the material desires, many different religions say that's kind of, especially Christianity, say that's more of the satanic route, to, you know, to follow your desires to the end. S sex orgies, prostitutes, black magic, you know, Hardcore drugs, Why all of it combined to together. Why does that have to be desires? That's not everybody's desires. No, but that's what I was going on. I know he was doing yeah. that. Like I, and I, you know, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It, it reminds me a lot of, I think it's like the satanic religion. <clears throat> yeah. Which is just all about like me and, um, you know, I do think that, there's so much benefit from his words, but I also think, you know, you're you're losing a bit of a balance because, you know, where are values and morals and, like, consideration of other people um, yeah. in those words, you know? I think, yeah, yeah it's out of balance. And, and he basically created a following by preaching this sort of lower animal nature um, of the human body uh, via sex and material pleasures so there's a lot of elite rich people kind of coming to them and having these big black magic sex parties and things mm. like that and because of that you know when you lower your mind into the more animalistic base um, energies it makes people easy to manipulate um, yeah. and you can manipulate and it's the kind public of where as society a whole is at <laughs> in yeah. a way right now like um a lot of unawakened people are very much driven by we would call it now consumer consumerism um, and like content and indulging yeah. whatever that be yeah. the said person and not you know being connected to their inner guidance and their higher selves and their real purpose of why they're here is not to just consume and indulge. Um, but also to challenge ourselves and learn lessons and we can really lose that on this path. It really reminds yeah. me of the the devil card with that inverted um, upside down pentagram, you know, yeah. where you've got your connection to spirit is like facing down. Um, so you actually completely lose your connection with self and yeah. your higher self and your higher purpose when you're living that way. Yeah. And so I, I kind of went over briefly this, you know, this uh, cult or religion um, because Jack Parsons um, was a member of the Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, often referred to as the OTO, which is Crowley's occult organization, which was founded in 1907. And... Yeah, so coming back to Jack Parsons, you can just I just put that in there so that you can see some of the activities he was involving yeah. himself in. And he actually never went to university. He didn't have more he didn't have anything but a high school diploma, but he had a deep experience building amateur rockets and he did so as a kid often like setting fires in his house and things like that. And he gathered a couple of buddies who included a Caltech grad student and got some money from the university to expand their experiments, working under the great physicist Theodore van Karman. And rather than have their campus blown up, Caltech sent the group, dubbed the Suicide Squad, up into the ARIO behind the university in 1934. Today, the spot is the location of JPL, or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And the group went commercial and founded Aerojet Corporation in 1942. And they built, they founded JPL in 1944, which gave Caltech a lucrative government contract to advance the growing rocket industry. And then everything fell apart. It was the era of McCarthyism, and there was a governmental scientist who had dabbled in Marxism and whose private life was undeniably subversive in the view of the Cold War government. 
As his occult behavior come to light, Jack Parson was fired from his own company, Aerojet and JPL, but was not charged by the government for having communist sympathies. He took a contract with Hughes Aircraft and was designing a plant for them to make rocket fuel when he was offered a position with Israel's new rocket program. While helping them uh, prepare a report for the Israelis, a Hughes clerk became suspicious that he might be an Israeli spy and reported to him to the FBI. He was fired from Hughes and deeply investigated, bringing all of his occult activities to light. And he would later become a successful rocket scientist after his exposure to the teachings of Crowley, who saw him as the magus or high priest of his new religion. And Parsons would use his skills to help NASA develop rockets for space exploration and research, including working on the V-2 rockets during World War II that were designed by Werner von Braun, who later helped develop America's first satellite. He and the members of the Suicide Squad founded JPL and... The two organizations, and most people, when they think of JPL, think that it's synonymous with NASA um, because the two organizations are wa- walking hand in hand currently as they stroll through space and all of that. But not all JPL projects are NASA projects, um, but basically, NASA funds JPL. Um, but there was a little thing that happened is that. JPL and NASA were working together to send the Mars Curiosity rover to mm. Mars. And they had to put these little holes in the treads of the tires so that it would, I don't know, reduce wear and tear or something like that. And JPL came up with this idea, oh, we should put our name in Morse code in the tires so that, you know, and NASA was like, no, don't do that. But then... JPL just went ahead and did that unbeknownst to NASA. So now there's JPL in Morse code written all over NASA because of the little holes in the Mars Mars. rope. Yeah, all over Mars. Yeah. Oh my God. (laughs) And so it says they all spell out JPL. And well, that's like it's basically them saying, don't try to tell us what to do. Yeah. (laughs) And also just like. There's, we all know, like, symbols and symbolism has so much power, holds so much power. So it's almost like there's a sort of, yeah, really putting their mark on Mars. and Yeah, exactly. Yeah, interesting. Um, but before all this even happened, JPL needed more scientists, and they ended up recruiting no one else but ex-German Nazis. And this came about in an infamous U.S. government um, act called Operation Paperclip. I've heard of this. And it was the name of the government's program to head into post-war Germany and salvage whatever brilliant minds they could before the Russians did. So they're like, okay, there was there was a lot of good science coming out of Germany during World War II. Mm. We need to get in and get those guys to our side before the Russians do. So yeah, as World War II was entering its final stages, American and British organizations teamed up to scour occupied Germany for much military, scientific, and technological development research as they could uncover. Trailing behind Allied combat troops, groups such as the Combined Intelligence Objective Subcommittee, CIOS, began confiscating war-related documents and materials and interrogating scientists as German research facilities were seized by Allied forces. One enlightening discovery recovered from a toilet at Bonn University was the Ozenberg List, a catalog of scientists and engineers that had been put to work for the Third Reich, Hitler's regime. In a covert affair originally dove Operation Overcast, but later renamed to Operation Paperclip, roughly 1,600 of these German scientists, along with their families, were brought to the U.S. to work on America's behalf during the Cold War. And the program was run by the newly formed Joint Intelligence Objective Agency, whose goal was to harness German intellectual resources to help develop America's arsenal of rockets, and other biological and chemical weapons 
to ensure such co coveted information did not fall into the hands of the Soviet Union. So, um, Harry Truman apparently forbade the act, but um, nevertheless, uh, the J.I. JIOA, the OSS, and the CIA bypassed this directive by eliminating or whitewashing incriminating evidence of the scientists' war crimes and, and sponging their records, basically, so that when it was passed over to the president, they had clean records. Mm -hmm. And so, basically lying. And they just did it because they believed that the intelligence was crucial to the country's post-war efforts. And this is where a man named Werner von Braun, who we mentioned a little bit earlier, comes into the picture. And he was part of the JPL um, group. And he was one of those scientists, one, one of, of the, the Nazi, Nazi scientists, scientists that the US had brought over um, with Operation Paperclip. And his experiences with rocketry ran alongside JPLs, except it was for Nazi Germany. So he was like one of the high rocket engineers, but for Nazis. And von Braun actually started his experimentation with rockets in the 1930s. And during World War II, he was appointed head of the V2 mass production program by Hitler himself. And the V2 was a really terrifying weapon. And the missile traveled so fast that victims, most of whom were civilians, often heard nothing until after the rocket struck. So for his part, Von Braun, who was apparently still interested in space travel, is said to have remarked that the rockets work perfectly, except for landing on the wrong planet, a line that at best paints him as a detached from the consequences of his work. But as fearsome as the V2 was, it had little strategic impact and failed to turn the war. Basically, von Braun ended up resisting um, Hitler and, oh no, resisting the U.S., sorry, and the move and ended up in, in oh no, sorry, he did resist Hitler um, and he was put in jail for a few weeks. Um, but while he was in jail, the Nazi war machine realized it needed him. And so they're like, put a gun to his head and like, you have to do this work. Yeah, I do think like probably especially with people who were important to Germany at the time, like they're scientists and inventors and stuff, like, you know, I'm sure they didn't really have a choice but to go along with the Nazi regime, but I could be totally wrong and they yeah, could probably be mix of both. evil people and mix stuff. Of both, yeah. But yeah, like it's not really like you would have a choice at that point. Yeah. <laughs> um to it, to stand up for what's right. You know, even, I don't know, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Yeah. You know. And while we get into Von Braun, well, who knows what his original intentions were, but towards the end of his life, it's almost like he was kind of turning sides and tried to expose some of the things that were going on within the government. We um, always appreciate a whistleblower. Yeah. <laughs> but um, once... Uh, he was recruited through Operation Paperclip in 1945. Von Braun ended up partnering with JPL, who Jack Parsons was the founder of, mm -hmm. and he came up with America's response to Sputnik, and that was the Explorer, and it resulted in one of the first major high-profile discoveries of the U.S. space program. Now, Von Braun is a very interesting character, not only because he was a former Nazi and rocket genius, but a while ago, WikiLeaks released the Podesta emails. As with previous leaks, they exposed massive amounts of corruption within the U.S. political system. And some of the Podesta leaks includes information about UFOs, extraterrestrials in the form of private emails that reveal some very interesting stuff. But before we get into that, we have to jump back to Jack Parsons and his most controversial involvement during his work with rockets. So one year after... Um, Von Braun has been recruited into the U.S. and joins JPL. Um, so this is 1946. Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard, the fa no one else but the founder of Scientology, but at this time Scientology hadn't become a thing yet. So this was before his Scientology days. L. Ron Hubbard attempted, Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard together attempted to usher 
a mystical feminine goddess into the world through a magical fornication ritual. <laughs> and this ritual was known as the ba Babylon Working Ritual. And these ceremonies drew inspiration from Aleister Crowley's novel Moonchild and attempted it to use intimate magic between Parsons and a woman to conceive a spirit world child who could thus usher in the otherworldly goddess Babylon. And Babylon was once a city in the Christian eyes. It mm -hmm. fell because it tried to reach too high. There was prostitution, things like that. It's kind of... Um, Babylon is kind of seen as also in the New Age community. Babylon is seen as like the modern day cities, you know, the modern day industry. It's like not good. It's not viewed as good. Mm. Um, but yeah, the story of the Babylon working ritual almost seems like a myth itself um, because it's almost more unbelievable than Crowley's Thelema religion and the rituals of the Order Temple, the OTO. And so basically, Jack Parsons and um, L. Ron Hubbard partook in a two-week ritual using chants and reproductive fluids to marshal Babylon into creation. The Scientologists have attempted to scrub Hubbard's involvement in black magic from public, public memory. He was not only present at the ceremonies, but presided over them. And though Parsons may not receive proper credit for being the father of modern day rocket science, the black magician was also responsible for launching rockets into space, as we know. So, How do we like have evidence of him being in the ceremonies? There's private letters and correspondence and witnesses and all sorts of things. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Babylon the mystical goddess Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard ultimately hoped to conjure was mostly the creation of Aleister Crowley, who is inspired by Babylon, an entity in the biblical book of Revelation. The mystical belief system Crowley created known as Thelema claimed Babylon was, or at least represented, Earth itself. The Gnostic belief to which Parsons ascribed referred to Babylon as Sophia and believed her to be the personification of wisdom. According to this system, she played a pivotal role in the creation of both the universe and humankind. But in summary, the myth of Sophia claims she birthed many evil beings while trapped in the underworld. One of these beings was the Demiurge, who created the world and imbued all its evil qualities. Sophia helped return light to the world, and when the Demiurge created Adam, she concealed the first man's consciousness, only returning it to the world through the first woman, Eve. It's an interesting twist on the tale. <laughs> In the book of Revelation, Babylon is portrayed very differently. Her forehead bears the words Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. <laughs> that is some <laughs> awful forehead tattoo. Yeah. What yeah. the hell? Could you imagine? <laughs> like stamped in Hebrew, whore. <laughs> whore of the earth and abomination. <laughs> oh, God. So... Yeah, it was said that Sophia was indeed the mother of abominations on the earth. And Why on the forehead? I don't know. It was just Christians <laughs> trying to depower women or something. But yeah, it says in the Christian Bible, it claims that in the end of days, Babylon will be left unclothed and her flesh will be eaten and burned with fire. Um, but yeah, uh, coming back. So that's who they're trying to invoke. But L. Ron Hubbard basically controlled the Babylon working ritual and Jack Parson. Because while Jack Parson was preparing for the occult ritual, um, Hubbard entered the scene. And Parsons told Crowley that although Hubbard lacked magical training, quote, he had an extraordinary amount of experience and understanding in the field. Hubbard appeared to have some sort of highly developed astral vision, according to Jack Parsons. And... However, Parsons and Hubbard friendship soon soured when Hubbard basically cheated with his girlfriend. Well, that's understandable. Um, it's and gonna sour after that. Still, despite the conflict, the two still proceeded with their plans for the Babylon working ritual uh, from January fourth to fifteenth in nineteen forty-six. And Hubbard wrote 
Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health in 1950, only four years after the Babylon Working Ritual, and in 1954 he infamously founded the Church of Scientology based on his writing. But the ritual itself, um, which sought to bring conceive a child from the astral plane, um, was basically... It worked? Well, you think it worked? We're, I'm not sure if it actually they worked. Have the child, the child would still be alive today, no? Well, yeah. So it was basically a lot of. Um, it was basically a sexual frenzy. It was a lot of rituals, chanting, trances, sex, sex fluid put into like cups and offered and stuff like that. Um, yes. So, yeah, Hubbard especially was really having a lot of sex between himself and women that they had recruited for the ceremonies. And over the course of two weeks, Hubbard and Parsons attempted to usher the astral child into the world. They, yeah, they engaged in ritual chanting, drawing occult symbols in the air with swords, dripping animal blood on ruined and pleasuring themselves in order to impregnate magical tablets. Now, when Crowley caught wind of this, he said, um, Apparently Parsons or Hubbard or somebody is producing a moon child. I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the idiocy of these louts. <laughs> so he kind of called them idiots and was like, eh, whatever. But yeah, they, uh, apparently the Babylon working ritual was meant to initiate the Eon of Horus, and it was meant to last anywhere from 100 to 2,000 years. Um, but after, not long after the ritual, Hubbard told Parsons that Parson would become the living flame before Babylon would appear. Unfortunately, the prophecy reached tragic fruition several years later on June 17, 1952, when Parsons was only 37 years old, his homeland, his home lab, strangely combusted, blew up, and half of his face did not survive the blast. And though he was alive when police arrived, he passed not long after. It's not that strange because he was like working with rockets yeah. and things like that. Like that stuff can happen. Yeah, and now some people, this is where a bit of the conspiracy comes in. So some people believe the Babylon working ritual is connected to Area 51 and that Hubbard and Parsons actually did succeed. And it wasn't really the new child, but actually a gray that they conceived. <laughs> Why is it connected to Area 51? Did Area 51 open up at the same time or something? Well, Area 51 is is the, you know, yeah, know infamous study is. place of the gray aliens yeah. and... Um, it was close to Area 51, where the, you know, located okay. UFOs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, basically, they just think, the conspiracy thinks that they succeeded, but what they created was a gray. And some little astral amoeba. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> believe any of it, to be honest. Yeah, and... I think they created anything, but just exhaust themselves in a sex frenzy couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, prior to Hubbard and Parsons' rituals, Crowley illustrated beings strongly resembling greys. And on a 1946 trip to New Mexico, Parsons allegedly contacted an extraterrestrial from Venus. These purported happenings were followed by the infamous events in Roswell in 1947. So they conducted their experiment in 1946. 1947 is the U famous UFO crash of Roswell and the apparent um retrieving of a alien life form mm -hmm. and capturing that and their technology so that they could backtrack the technology um and yeah these theories cite the fact that parsons has been scrubbed from histories from the history and at least significantly downplayed by the u.s government who may have discovered the nature and scope of his task. I think he was like more likely scrubbed because his connection with the Scientology guy and you know what that all ended up becoming yeah. and obviously you know 
he blew his face off in his own home lab and you know doesn't exactly have a great history like to be connected with NASA yeah. Yeah. so they I don't agree that it should have been scrubbed and shouldn't take people having to dig to find that stuff out they should know that sort of stuff but yeah I don't know what do you think <laughs> Yeah, who knows? I, I don't know. I can't say that their ritual was anything but sex and men playing with swords. Yeah. Both. But I don't know if it's connected to the um, the aliens. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I feel like that on the past stretch. It's just strange that everything's happening. You know, a lot of things happen in this little time window. Yeah. You know? A lot of influential figures. Nikola Tesla, he came up with electromagnetic propulsion and free energy in that age that was then suppressed. And he had, um, and then he was like scrubbed and made, you know, at, at his time he was kind of just, he died poor and alone. And some people think he was killed. And, um, then you have Aleister Crowley, you have these space pioneers, yeah, you have World it's War II. Yeah, shifting consciousness happening. You know? Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where Jack Parsons' life ultimately ended to him blowing up in his own lab. So young. Yeah. At 37. But his founding of JPL is still very influential and he did help pioneer a lot of rockets into space um, and help America win the space race if they did and in in that JPL organization was Von Braun and so we're coming back to him because and his relation to some of the WikiLeaks emails that we mentioned earlier so on one in particular was from Apollo 14 astronaut, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, and it reads as follows. Dear John, because the war in space race is heating up, I felt you should be aware of several factors as you and I schedule our Skype talk. Remember, our nonviolent ETI from the contiguous universe are helping us bring zero point energy to Earth. Zero point energy was what Tesla was trying to bring in. So that's just something to hold on. And we have this astronaut, Edgar Mitchell, talking about it. But no one knows about zero-point energy in the mainstream today. But yeah. this was something that Tesla was trying to bring in, that zero-point energy. Um, and it said that's also what, you know, um, who is that guy who worked with the UFOs? Um, Bob. Yeah, Lazar. Bob Lazar. Yeah. So when was this email sent? Um, sometime in the, I can't remember, it's not exactly right, quite date recently. stamped. Edgar Mitchell and the Apollo 14 mission, I'm not sure when that was. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't have anything on me to quickly check, but you can look that up for yourselves. Um, the following information in Talix was shared by Carl Rawson, who worked closely for several years with Werner von Braun before his death. Carol and I have worked on the treaty on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space attached for your convenience. So Werner von Braun, towards the end of his life, was trying to prevent the governments from placing weapons in outer space. For what reason? I don't know. And why was the government trying to do that? But in the email, he mentions Carol Rawson, who is the first female corporate manager of Fairchild Industries. A space and missile defense consultant who has worked with various corporations, government departments, and intelligence communities. Um, and she worked closely with Werner von Braun before his death, specifically on the subject of space-based weapons. Below is a very telling interview with Carol that was conducted by Dr. Stephen Greer, founder of the Disclosure Project. Mm -hmm. And Greer, accompanied by Dr. Edgar Mitchell in all his communications and meetings with the Pentagon, has been instrumental in bringing forth hundreds of military whistleblowers of all ranks with verified credentials and backgrounds. In this interview, she brings up the idea of a false flag alien threat. The term false flag describes covert operations that are designed to be misleading to make it appear as though events are being carried out by entities, groups, or nations other than those who actually planned and executed them. You could say that 9-11 was a false flag event. 
yeah, depending on what you that. believe. <laughs> um, so this is this what, is like on an alien level. So like yeah. that's really gonna freak people out if they ever really did try and push that. Yeah, it would freak people out, right? Because you'd be like, "What? We're getting attacked by aliens?" Yeah. Well, a lot of different governments try to do this by creating an enemy for the people to band towards so that they can fight for a cause and start recruiting yeah, more yeah. people to the military. But basically what happened is, um, this is their interview. I, made, I met the late Dr. Werner Von Braun in early 74. At that time, Von Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played. That game being the effort to weaponize space to control Earth from space and space itself. He asked me to be his spokesperson, to appear on occasion when he was too ill to speak, and I did. And what he asked me to do was to educate decision makers and the public about why we shouldn't be putting weapons into space and what the alternatives are, how we could be building a cooperative space system. So we can see Werner von Braun, he resisted Hitler, and was forced to do Hitler's work in the end. And then now he was brought forcefully to the U.S. by the U.S. government. And now he's kind of trying to go against them again yeah. towards his, his later life. And the interview goes on saying, what was most interesting to me was a repetitive sentence that he said to me over and over again. And that was the strategy that was being used by the government to educate the public and decision makers and the scare tactics, the spin that was being put on the weapon system. And that was how we would identify an enemy. The enemy at first, Werner von Braun said, the enemy against whom we're going to build a space-based weapon system. First, the Russians are going to be considered the enemy. Okay, that's happened multiple times. It's yeah, happening right now. It's happening right now. Then terrorists would be identified. I mean, 9-11. And that was soon to follow. Then we were going to identify third world crazies. Now we call them nations of concern. And the next enemy was asteroids. And against asteroids, we're going to build space-based weapons. And then the greatest of all, was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. And that would be the final card. And over and over and over, during the four years that Carol knew him, he was giving, she was giving him his speeches for him, and he would bring up that last card. Remember, the U.S. government are going to use aliens as yeah. a way, as a fake enemy, as a false flag. It makes sense, like, why they're trying to replicate the technology of aliens, not only because, you know, it would be great to have this advanced technology, but, you know, also to mimic UFOs. Well, actually, linking to this, um, there is another conspiracy that actually we've never been visited by extraterrestrials and actually Tesla succeeded in creating his flying saucer because we've done an episode on this and Nikola Tesla had an invention for a flying saucer. It's said that the Nazis and the Germans also had some sort of propulsion system that would be similar to what we would think of as a UFO. They had disc-shaped objects and stuff like that. And... It was said that Nikola Tesla actually succeeded in his electropropulsion system and created his craft and that that was why the government outed him and took his all his papers because when his family went in, the government had taken all of his documents and classified them. So. Yeah, I, I do think that's possible, but I, I do think that we have been visited by... UFOs yeah. and, and aliens because of like the multiple stories you've heard of professionals who have worked in um, the nuclear weapons yeah and how like they would see these UFOs come in 
um, when they're like trying to work on testing these nuclear nuclear weapons and like suddenly like all of the equipment is shut off and damaged and it can't be used anymore and um, I think they're actually benevolent beings who are trying to protect earth and protect this space as well because the yeah. damage hit goes expands out into space and, yeah um yeah and when we hear admiral bird's story you know the beings he made contact with so admiral bird was uh, the in- the pilot who did uh space i mean flight exploration into antarctica and yeah. was, these are the inner earth beings yeah claimed to meet these um beings with of nordic looking origin only taller and more luminous and that they told him we have been forced to come out and reveal ourselves because you have developed nuclear weapons and they go against nature and that was, and you know that was the reason why they started coming out so it could be that yeah it, it isn't even an extraterrestrial but an intraterrestrial sort of um intervention um or it could be um our own people stopping yeah. those missiles who knows i don't I, know I the would truth go as far as to theorize to say that um the the nikola tesla thing could possibly be that he because a lot of what he was coming out with seemed like channeling yeah and he said he in could a, have very well been just channeling the technology of these crafts um, from the beings that were using them because yeah. when we hear um, what Bob Lazar has to say we we know that inside these ships it's not built for a human yeah um, they're very small for like yeah. a, a, a child of five the age of five you know it wouldn't yeah. make sense for us to build a craft this way yeah and for me i just intuitively feel like it definitely isn't a craft built by a human but i it, to not discredit Nick, yeah. nikola tesla that he could have very well like he i do think with many of his things he even said that he would basically channel his information from the ether it would come in as this knowing this download mm. um and he was like getting that you know from another being possibly yeah there's a newspaper article where he is interviewed and he talks about his process of even speaking with the different planetary spheres and it doesn't (laughs) make sense though either sorry that um they uh, our people would shut off the nuclear weapons when it's our people who are working on the nuclear weapons i thought it was nuclear silos in different countries like Russian nuclear silos that could, got that, shut off. That could be, yeah. But no, no, it was in America. There was one in America. Yeah, in America. Oh, cool. Yeah. So well. Yeah. So that's all kind of getting into the alien stuff, and aliens have really been pushed, and you know we have the Israeli Prime Minister of Defense talking about the Galactic Federation. We have the U.S. government releasing UFO footage. You know, it's all sort of starting to be... Yeah, there's right still now. new UFO footage being released and the government are releasing new documents and stuff like that. It really seems... But basically, the last thing Werner Von Braun said is that he said, we're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens and all of it is a lie. That was some of the things he kept repeating over and over again at the end of his life. It's all a lie. You know, we're going to have this fake battle. Yeah. Um, And you can see even there's this... um, All war has been fake. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, if you really think about it, it's all been driven to serve um, the higher-ups. And it's a very small group of people. It does not benefit anyone. Most people want to live in peace. Most people um, don't give an F about borders and want people to live free. Yeah, well, it's more so nowadays. I mean, you know, back then you could have like tribal warfare where, oh, these people stole our women. We must take them back. You know, well, it's yeah, like... <laughs> if you're doing a bad thing. Yeah. But I mean, that's not most people. Like, no. In my opinion, I don't feel no, like nowadays, most people are like, bad. They have, the, especially the US government, are notorious for hosting fake campaigns, um, like let's say in Iraq, Iran, yeah. Afghanistan, Vietnam, all, those all to get have resources. A lot of oil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what they're 
trying to do. So what resources are they trying to claim now? Or is it going back to another conspiracy that kind of comes up more in right wing um, spheres and within America? And that is a globalist government where the theory says is that the U.S. government is trying to basically have a government that governs the entire world. No more, yeah. no more separate nations. It's one government that controls planet Earth because there is a theory... And that's what they're definitely pushing. You're so right. right. They're definitely pushing that. Yeah. Yeah, the one world, new world order, is it? Yeah. Yeah. And it, you can see, okay, that, ooh, now we are going to be the leaders in space weapons. We're going to be able to now install weapons in space for this countermeasure, this attack that's coming apparently. Mm. And now that we have weapons in space, not only are the pe- anyone from space at danger, but what happens when they turn their weapons inward? Then you've got weapons pointed at Earth, at any nation. Yeah, it's so <laughs> screwed up. Like, it's just instantly making me think of that, like, that movie we watched recently that just came out with Leonardo DiCaprio and just the stupid yeah. decision of, like, yeah. the money and power-obsessed people who, like, don't want to stop this comet. They'll let it collide into Earth just for, for the chance of, like, gaining the these materials that are going to make them multi-multi-trillionaires which they're, they're already ridiculously rich. They're Amazing. already ridiculously powerful. But this is the endless pit of money and power. But we have, to follow, we have to follow what's coming out in the mainstream. Because right now we've had all these big actors, big production, just seed the idea of a meteor hitting Earth. Oh yeah, it's and so true, yeah. here in his things, he said, after, um, you know, the terrorists and Russia's the enemy... The next enemy will be asteroids. And against asteroids, we're going to build space-based weapons. And then after that, it will be the extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. But you can see them seeding little things. And you have to watch the mainstream for what they're trying to plant in. But, yeah, space and all of this can't... We have to come in to... You know, I transitioned from, I guess, my atheist beliefs and kind of moved into the new age through Hinduism and stuff like that. But as I dove more into the new age, I really began to get into the whole new age alien movement, right? <laughs> that's a big thing that's going star on. Seed. Yeah, yeah, the star seeds, the Pleiadians, the yeah. reptilians, reptilians controlling the government, this, this, and that. And Illuminati. What, yeah, but what started as maybe myth or, uh, or some sort of story to kind of um, represent something. Um, you know, our, our modern day myth that's being born has kind of transitioned into something different. Now, people are saying Jesus was an alien. These influential people... Who's saying that? That's really coming about. There's a whole, like, oh, Jesus, alien, he came from, you know... He came from this planet. He's actually an extraterrestrial being that comes from. Well, this he's planet. a sun being, but yeah. I mean, like, that's just because you know you you your soul has come from having like previous lives there. He was a human, surely. Yeah. But not only that is that you know we are kind of falling into a little bit of like a savior thing, like oh the you know we're. The Pleiadians will come and they'll help us against the war against the aliens. Oh, the Anun- oh, the reptilians will come and yeah. dominate us. Yeah, oh, the, uh, the the Greys are a futuristic version of ourselves, which yeah. you know does kind of resonate. To and the the re- sorry, what the, the Anunnaki? They were beings that came and enslaved humanity and made us mine gold. That's Zechariah Sitchin. Um, and then there's also, um, oh God, well, there's the Galactic Lemarians. Federation that people are talking about. Oh yeah, but that was even mentioned by the government recently, but I can't remember whether that they were, it was in a positive or negative sense that it was mentioned. Do you remember? Was it like the Turkish government or uh, someone like that? It's the Israeli military, um, uh, governor of defense. Yeah, but was it? Like was a negative. No, he said they were work- He said that 
world governments are working with the extraterrestrial group known as the Galactic Federation. Yeah. Um, but you can see how it, New Age and the government are almost blending together in a, in a, in a way. And it's almost, also things have changed. So our history, what used to be maybe prominent, wise, enlightened human figures are now becoming descendants from a different alien race. The people who kickstarted foundation at the end of the ice age, extraterrestrial origins, this, that, and it's almost like the pyramids. They were built by ETs, you know, all the famous world sites, aliens built them. But what, what is it doing? Is, is it taking away yeah, our I own know. human power? And attributing, like, what are we, what have we done then? You know, we've done, you know, nothing but blow ourselves up. And it's like, we have no sovereignty within our, our spir spiritual claims anymore. And it's almost like we need these aliens, right? To right. help us, to help us, give us these advanced technologies, help us evolve through them, right? So it's kind of this weird narrative that's coming in. But that is big in the New Age movement right yeah, now. Yeah, and a lot of people, like, you know completely disconnect from their humanness in a sense and completely like claim that, that they are a you know a Sy Syrian or a, mm -hmm. a, a Syria from Sirius they're f you know or they're from the Pallades or um but completely dismissing that well actually right now you're from earth yeah and like it's not dismissing that they definitely probably have soul history in those places like i'm not dismissing that yeah but like you said it takes away the power of your human existence and yeah. and what you're doing in in this moment yeah and it's a narrative that's familiar with a different face it's like it's a savior mentality that human likes to fall into and it's not just with god or different religions where we need to be saved, we need to be forgiven by an external power. Some new alien needs to come in and give us the technology and deem us worthy enough to evolve. You know, it's a kind of a, a, a narrative that keeps being pushed, but with different faces and different things. And speaking of aliens, we can't not talk about Scientology. And since yeah. L. Ron Hubbard has been interlinked within the space pioneers the rituals of Aleister Crowley and Jack Parson, his involvement with Jack Parson and, you know, being co connected with JPL and even Werner Von Braun, they must have been in the same spheres around that time. And there's nothing about that. Scientology is the religion of alien, basically. Yeah, and that's it's it's laughed about so much now it's not taken seriously in the mainstream most e even in the spiritual community people kind of look down upon uh, scientology yeah but um like you say so much new age information comes from scientology. and what i what, what i know is that the the true genius of i mean the government are very smart in some ways and the true genius is subliminal messaging what are they seeding and making us believe is our invention, our creation, our story, you know? And when we begin to go into Scientology, basically, Scientology um, is founded based on the principle of this almighty alien named Xenu. And he was the head of a 76 planet galactic federation. You have those, exact, those words coming up again. The New Age movement uses the Galactic Federation, the Pleiadians. You know, you have, um, who, who's that guy who talked about the Blue Avians? Corey Good. Corey Good talks about the Galactic Federation and, and all lo the time. There's loads you know? of um, yeah. like big, quite big channel channelers. You know, they have big chan like YouTubes and they're big on TikTok and all that. Yeah. And they are channeling beings or, or they're they're themselves are working in the galactic yeah. federation and, yeah. and in this sorry <clears throat> creates like uh i'm very off put by that i'm very deep in the spiritual community but i am quite off put by when someone takes that stance because you're then putting yourself above other people 
like I'm a part of this galactic federation and, yeah. and I can tell you information about stuff that you, you you can't know and that's why I do I'm not Christian but I resonate with Christ consciousness and, and Jesus yeah. and the message of Jesus because this is all about your personal path you you know you finding your own sense of self and your own power yeah and he his message is not you know not the religious side but not about you know putting your power in another being or yeah. or these these beings above us and yeah. so you, well yeah christ teaches that christ is in you and ultimately he sacrificed yeah. himself to help humanity and it's it's the egoless um existence it's the pure consciousness it's the re- the, the god realization within all of us yeah and it's the sacred pillar of light that uplifts all humanity and is the channel for us into a um, astral world of beauty and of love exactly. and like things like the, that. It's the I am, the I am is God because we all have that. We all are I am and we all have that connection that of oneness. Yeah, and I've experienced like... So DMT stimulates the effect of death and um, what happens to your consciousness after. And I've been to some scary places in DMT. But one of the most beautiful ones was when I was with a Christian. And we climbed to this mountaintop and we sat in us, just him and I. And he called in Archangel Michael to sit with us and Jesus and as their presence. And he called them in. And a lot of the time, it's a bumpy ride through the astral dimension when you shoot up into those realms. And you can meet all sorts of crazy, freaky deities and beings. You can get trapped into these cycles of fear and stuff like that. And what happened with him was I smoked it. And it was the calmest, clearest moment of DMT experience ever where a pillar just rose up and I just followed the pillar into infinite light and love. And it was like the calling in of Jesus and the angels was like a pillar for the spirit, a path for the spirit to follow in the afterlife. Mm-hmm. And I'm not Christian at all. This is just what I experienced. No, you know? we're not. We're not like pro-religion in any sense. Yeah, because um, I think religion more, is man-made. Yeah, it's, it's just I do believe like Jesus did come here with a real message and it was nothing to do with religion it was just he had this huge realization of what we all are as individuals and how powerful we are as humans you know here all of us individually and how we can connect to this infinite love and how much that can um, improve our lives and the lives of others and the the health of the earth Um, and and that's what it is. It's beautiful, and that's why these, you know, the the whole narrative of um, these these beings, like the Galactic Federation, and you know, they're in charge. It's basically like creating a spiritual government. Yeah. You know, and it's like I I don't think government works on a human level, yeah. really. Yeah. No, these, it should be these... community based. We shouldn't have a huge government. You know, we should be running within small communities. That's how I think it works better. But like then to bring in like a bloody government within the spiritual realm within beings who are meant to be high dimensional beings and what they're walking around in blue spacesuits having a government and we're supposed to follow those it's people it's just red yeah, flags huge yeah, red exactly. flags exactly and but what i'm saying is like we have this galactic federation buzzwords kind of from many different sources and we know that um, Elrond Hubbard had connections within JPL and not only the OTO and Crowley's organizations as well as NASA and the space programs. So he had connections here and maybe what we don't know what he knows or what he found out in that time. But yeah, he did eventually start up and there has been battles with the US government and Scientology, legal battles and stuff for like tax evasion and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so basically the story of Xenu is that his confederation was plagued by overpopulation. And although exactly what type of being was overpopulating the galaxy isn't clear, but the beings are called people and aliens in different sources. 
according to the OT3. So he also took Crowley's structure, so the OTO. Um, uh, he kind of adopted a bit of that structure within his own cult and religion. So the OT3 materials are the operating Thetan 3, and, um, you know, that Thetan was the is a word that Crowley was using, and it's a special level of consciousness Scientology members strive towards. And there were apparently 178 billion beings per planet, and Xenu needed to do something about the problem. So he con concocted a ruse to get a large number of people to come see him, and he issued a tax on artists and criminals that required them to pay in person. Once the artists and criminals arrived, he had them frozen in an alcohol solution and put them on ships that looked look like DC-8 airplanes. Um, another version of this story is that Zeno had his men gather up large number of people, freeze them, and put them on ships. And then Zeno then sent these prisoners to Earth, known then as Tigiak. Sounds a lot like what we did to the Australians. Um, Zenu detains, detainees were dropped into 10 volcanoes on earth and released from their f flesh prisons. So he basically put these, killed these beings, but then, and then he, he then detonated hydrogen bombs, depriving the beings of their bodies and released their thetans or immortal souls into the atmosphere. And these thetans are what Scientolo Scientologists today believe is plaguing humanity. They stick on to human beings in the form of addiction and spiritual harm. And you'll see again within the very early access into Scientology, it's just going to be, it's a lot of self-help, self-development, self-growth. What different you new surely age... Surely you're not like going in learning about no, this. No, you're not. Because if you go in learning about this, they wouldn't have any freaking problems. No, it's OT3 where you become. Um, but until you get that, and you can't even say the word Xenu or mention it point. or read anything about Xenu because it might make you sick and kill you. <laughs> so is he like a god or like their devil? No, he no, he's some super extra... He's their kind of god. Yeah. Yeah, but is he... Bill Gates a Scientologist? You know, because he no. really believes in the depopulation. I well, I don't know. He might not be outwardly. I don't think he's outwardly a Scientologist. Um, I wouldn't be he's surprised atheist, if though, like you know. a lot of these pe these elites that believe in depopulation, they're trying to, you know, depopulate the planet. Do have a, a secret or underground connection with Scientology? Yeah. Well, I mean, Tom Cruise does, but. Um, yeah, basically to get to OT3, you need to pay a lot of money to get there. It's something like 250000 to $350,000 to get there. So most entry-level Scientologists, you know, you might come in, but you only be kind of spreading the word, learning some basic like self-help, some little bits of things that are a bit esoteric and magical, but you won't be getting into the Xenu lore until you get quite higher. Um, and maybe it's to... <laughs> So that people don't leave because it has a lot of holes in its story. Because um, apparently Xenu is alive and trapped in an electronic cage on an unnamed desert planet. And um, some what? say that Xenu puts soul implant stations on Venus and in Mars and also in Africa. And um, Xenu decimated the atmospheres of both Venus and Mars, killing any and all life. It's some god that you got. And then he set up implant stations to which disembodied souls could return on Venus and Mars and an undisclosed location in Africa. And yeah, so maybe that's why they're trying to um, blow up Mars or send something to Mars so they can release Xenu from his electronic cage. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> how did he even get in the cage? Did he get there? Did they chain him up in some how sort of sex ritual? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically Xenu also says that he implemented additional t techniques to prov He's basically set a net, an astral net around... Um, and buoys around space, and that if they're triggered, um, Xenu will somehow break out of his electric prison and return to Earth and destroy it. And some people relate Xenu to Nibiru, which is the 12th planet that is apparently said to come, or 
something like that. Um, but a former member said, at some point after Xenu put us here, an invader force called the Fifth Invader Force came without realizing that this solar system was screened off from the rest of the galaxy. They were defeated and also trapped here on Earth with us. In fact, the moon is a space station they brought with them. This sounds like a really awful science fiction novel. Yeah, it, re- it really does. And and so did he channel this, the sex ritual guy? The owner of... Yeah, L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, he was granted this through Astral Vision. So he channeled the whole religion. The whole 75 million, billion year, his, trillion year history of, of Earth and mm-hmm. humanity and souls. That's It's like 75 trillion year lore that goes on. And he actually has like like millions of words on this it's not you know this is abbreviated he's got book after book after book after book it's not available to the public like you say you have to pay a lot of money to get this information can you imagine you paid so much money and you get this really awful science fiction trilogy three hundred and fifty thousand dollars it's confirmed about three hundred fifty dollars thousand dollars contributed to become to start receiving ot3 training which also includes like psychic development and stuff like that and how to manipulate matter and read people's thoughts. Um, read people's thoughts? Read. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's... But we have... He, he lists a bunch of different aliens and beings and um, stuff like that. But yeah, a lot of what he says is in the mainstream New Age movement and what a lot of people are doing for self-growth and self-development and you can see a lot of the individualism that maybe even Aleister Crowley was talking about that might have inspired the New Age movement in some regards. Um, you know, you see a lot of freedom of expression now. People are less, more and more people are getting into polyamorous relationships. And um, not only that, but just, you know, just more being into sex. Being openly and, gay, being, you know... Um, openly you know asexual in multi-relationships like things that people weren't allowed to feel yeah and it's comfortable a- about in the past is like now it's being pushed that you know this should be accepted and this should be okay and which it should definitely yeah. like, and there's but- a lot of individuals trying to define themselves right now yeah you see with different movements around the world i'm not going to name anything but what happens is that a lot what is happening now is i think we're in the era of labeling you know where we're trying to individualize ourselves so much that our self-identity becomes this long list of different things i'm a this 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 we're trying to label so many different things as our individuality and wrap it into a little package um and i think a lot of errors come when you actually try to label yourself i think you know you can't know the true nature of something once you begin to label it into a kind of small mind construct of what you are, um, because then you kind of limit yourself into that. Um, some people can feel that it's um, empowering to be labeled mm-hmm. or named or um, be recognized for that label. Um, but yeah, I totally agree, and I think um, I where I really think it's so important and that's what I do agree about these religions is that people have the freedom to do what they wish you know and that makes them happy without being killed as long as something as long as they're not harming other people animals or children obviously um and the freedom to be who they are and you know to call themselves what they want and identify as what they want you know it is really important um, but I also agree with the, um, you know, we can be free without all the labels, right? We can be who we are. Um, and it also can, like, sort of take away from your own, like, individual individualism, you know? Yeah. Because you're, you are you and you're exactly what you are. Awesome. And you don't need to, yeah. you don't necessarily have to fit in a box or or be connected to a label and for me um you know where i really had that realization recently was within like you know the mental health sphere you can be dealing with um some of your own mental health or emotional health issues um and there's just so many 
labels out there that can be connected um, to these symptoms or how you're feeling and everything instead of just you know feeling how you're feeling and finding your own process around healing that um it can also be quite limiting to like bang a label on something like that um, yeah well you have a box here and let's say you don't want to fit into that box but what are you doing you're going now over here and creating another box right the whole thing about present moment yeah something about that of being just purely aware and having a mind that's still and clear is that there the mental faculties rescind until you are just what you are yeah everything around you is just what it is and so you can see it you can see nature for what it truly is instead of you might see a bug and that might have attached label. Can a bug is label and then you might have attached labels to that of fear as a child because a bug bit me or fear of social constructs because of what so, so now this bug has all this mental constructs plumped onto it and you've yeah. boxed it up and wrapped it neatly until you begin to deconstruct it and question that and the present moment deconstructs it all when you enter that state, you deconstruct all the labels and are just existing within reality as it is. And yeah. so I think that is like, that is when you reach a level of pure consciousness where you're no longer, you know, filtering your idea, your, your reality through your mind in that way. And I think it's always <clears throat> so true. And it's also important to, you know, know that these things will come up and you'll connect to something and then after a while you'll be like you know I don't need this label anymore like you know I find there is a process in that you know that people go through through you know the label can bring some kind of soothing and comfort oh, yeah. and then you get to a point where you're like okay I can move on from this I can release this because it is boxing me in and I remember once I don't know if it's on the podcast but I definitely know it was you who made a point of it to me mm. was um, how in the olden days we didn't have a word for um, mad crazy mental illness right these people were just that's just how they were and and that allowed us to um, receive information from a very different mind, a very different perspective um, into the community, into the realm where these people can now be either drugged up, um, you know, labelled, uh, put in a mental hospital. Um, yeah, there's a quote that... They're, they're, they could be possibly just connecting with, you know, they're seeing a different realm, but it doesn't mean that information isn't... You know, it couldn't, um, you know, connect with people or bring things and mm. um, new ideas, uh, new inventions and stuff in, into the world. Like, but that by boxing that in now and pushing it out of society um, and hiding it away or, or dosing it up, I feel like, you know, maybe um, the community is missing out from doing something like that. Yeah, they say, there's this quote that says it's a tragedy that we're institutionalizing all our modern day prophets. You yeah. know, something, it's something along those lines. And that, you know, people who we might call schizophrenic could have once been the wise shamans of the world had yeah. they been guided properly by the other, the, the past oracles. shamans, you know, and, and things like yeah. that. And through time and how, how have things changed. And because they don't fit into a box, we've now wrap them wrap their symptoms into another box that's been contained and only because it doesn't fit in to the box that we're in so because this is out we have to now you know and all you know psychological things and mental illnesses are just symptoms and the symptoms can all stem from s different sources but the most of the sources are a form of trauma of some yeah. kind um and things like that but yeah so it's um got into a little bit of a tangent yeah. but something related but yeah so well because these sort of subjects just definitely do get you thinking about you know how how has this history like had its effect on the current state of the world and um, particularly in spirituality it's obviously had a big influence so yeah it's yeah. it's great to see um 
this becoming connected with you know NASA and the government and come down bring it back to Scientology yeah and um, very interesting yeah so we have like so many figures in this time and it's just you know this NASA and the government like to kind of cover up their origins but literally the founding group of NASA JPL was founded by Jack Parsons who was a notorious occultist and fan of Aleister Crowley joined the OTO did a crazy sex ritual with L. Ron Hubbard to try and bring in some baby space fetus <laughs> to usher in the new new age wrote Aeon, his Aeon name all over Mars wrote his, wrote his company name all over Mars um, and then blew up in a lab and as well as corroborated with former Nazi guy who ended up turning to be perhaps a good guy, a whistleblower trying to help lead humanity back into the right places um, so. as well as you know Nikola Tesla's time in this in this whole existence where he's trying to move away from rocket fuel and big you know you know fossil fuel propulsion and move into an electromagnetic propulsion which is clean and uses none of that fossil fuel energy so yes yeah, so many different cool things that kind of are all happening in that time and they're all interlaced in some ways to one another yeah so interesting thank you trey for yeah it was a fun gathering one. this one it was very fun and i'm sure everyone watching especially to this point has also enjoyed the topic yeah so what do you think is the new age really uh government fueled uh, Scientology Scientology uh, branch yeah. ba branching off even Aleister Crowley's work and all that stuff um, let us know in the comments yeah we'd love to hear <laughs> definitely yeah and if you have any other information or things that you think would be interested we'd love to hear it new topic and, ideas yeah and if you want to support the work we do we go and do a, a lot of research and but we love to do it um, but you can buy us a book or yeah. uh, support us there um, and if you don't have any money that's no problem at all you can support us by giving a like or subscribing and sharing this video yeah thank you yeah yeah all um, right guys we'll see you next time bye bye